Flight 8501 was on a routine flight to Singapore. They were cruising at 32,000 feet over the Java Sea. But fate had other plans for the passengers and crew on board this Indonesian airliner. What started as a routine flight soon turned into a nightmare as one of the plane's computer systems failed. The confusion among the crew quickly escalated. The plane entered into an aerodynamic stall and began plunging towards the Java Sea. The cockpit was filled with tension as the crew struggled to regain control of the aircraft. The fate of Air Asia Flight 8501 and its passengers would be forever changed as the aircraft disappeared from radar, plunging into the Java Sea. All 162 people on board were killed. How could this happen to one of the most sophisticated airplanes in the world? Join us as we study Air Asia Flight 8501, a flight that would leave a lasting impact on the aviation industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. It was just another day for Air Asia Flight 8501. A modern Airbus A320 with an experienced crew on board, scheduled to depart from Surabaya, Indonesia to Singapore. The crew consisted of the 53-year-old captain, a seasoned Indonesian pilot with over 20,500 hours of flying experience, and the first officer, a 46-year-old French pilot with over 2,250 hours of flight time. Together, they had accumulated a significant amount of experience on the Airbus A320, the very aircraft they are about to take to the skies. Their mission is simple, to fly the 156 passengers on board safely to their destination, Changi International Airport, Singapore. This flight route was not without its dangers. The route passed through a volatile region with frequent thunderstorms and heavy rain. But the weather seemed to be on their side that day. The crew was confident that they could complete the flight without any issues. If everything goes as planned, it will only take about two hours to get to their destination, Singapore. Today's flight will have the first officer flying the plane and the captain monitoring the instruments and performing other support duties. At 5.35 am, the aircraft lifts off from the Juanda International Airport and heads west on route Mike 635 towards Singapore. After 14 minutes into the flight, the plane reaches its cruising altitude of 32,000 feet. The first officer then makes a request to activate the anti-ice system as a precautionary measure to prevent any icing conditions that may occur during the flight. As a warning of anticipated turbulence ahead, the flight attendant's voice now echoes throughout the cabin, advising the passengers to fasten their seat belts. Within minutes, the pilot's attention is drawn to a distracting notification on the aircraft's Electronic Centralized Aircraft Monitor, or ECAM. A warning chime and an alarming master caution light that illuminates the cockpit go along with the message. The ECAM is a critical system on Airbus aircraft that provides pilots with essential information about the status of the aircraft's system and engines. In the event of any malfunction, the ECAM will display the fault and may also display the appropriate steps of remedial action. The ECAM display read Auto Flight Rudder Travel Limiter System, suggesting that both rudder travel limiter units have failed. The rudder is a part of the airplane's tail that helps to control the direction the airplane is going in. It moves from side to side to help the airplane turn left or right. The rudder travel limiter unit is a safety feature in an airplane 
that prevents the rudder from moving too much when the airplane is flying at high speeds. Sometimes, if the rudder moves too much, it can put stress on the airplane's tail section and cause damage. It's a bit like driving a car. When you're going fast, only a small movement of the steering wheel is needed to change direction. Luckily, this issue with the airplane today is not a permanent problem. It can be resolved by following the steps outlined in the ECAM. The pilots read and carried out the necessary actions instructed by the ECAM. They reset the flight argumentation computers that are responsible for controlling the rudder travel limiter units. It is performed by turning off the flight argumentation computer, which are labeled as FAC1 and FAC2 push buttons on the overhead panel, and then turning them back on one by one. After performing this action, both rudder travel limiter units return to normal function. As their journey to Singapore continues, the pilots noticed bad weather ahead of the route. To avoid any potential danger, they quickly made a request to the air traffic controller to change their route by 15 miles to the left, which was approved by the controller. The pilots then altered their heading to 310 degrees and continued on their journey. After setting into their new flight path, the pilots took some time to conduct a crew briefing. They also discussed their alternative airport, Simarang, just in case they need to divert from their original destination. As the briefing came to a close, the pilots were alerted to a problem with both rudder travel limiter units for the second time, triggering a warning chime and caution light. The pilots remained calm and repeated the ECAM action and the system returned to normal operation. As the plane continued its journey, the pilots requested to climb to 38,000 feet to stay clear of bad weather but was asked to stand by by the Jakarta radar controller. During this critical moment, the third failure on both rudder travel limiter units occurred. The pilots swiftly followed the ECAM actions and the system returned to normal operation. But just two minutes later, a fourth failure occurred, triggering a loud chime and master caution light. Despite the repeated failures of the rudder travel limiter units, the pilots were still able to maintain a safe flight thanks to the availability of systems like the autopilot, autotrust and other systems controlled by the flight argumentation computer. Nonetheless, the captain was not satisfied to simply rely on the standard ECAM actions to resolve the issue, which he believes were ineffective in resolving this repetitive fault. As the problem continued in the cockpit, the Jakarta radar controller attempted to contact the aircraft and issue clearance to climb to 34,000 feet. But the pilots never responded. They were too preoccupied with an unusual course of action which would ultimately determine the fate of 162 souls on board. Three days prior to this flight, the captain had encountered the same issue with the rudder travel limiter while the aircraft was on the ground. Fortunately, the ground engineers were able to resolve the issue by resetting the FAC circuit breakers. This experience influenced the captain to adapt the same procedure on this flight, but this time, the plane is flying over the Java Sea at 32,000 feet. The FAC-1 circuit breakers are located on the overhead panel and the FAC-2 circuit breakers are behind the right pilot seat. According to the Airbus A320 Quick Reference Handbook, in-flight computer resets should only be limited to those specified in the handbook table and those specified in the procedural bulletin. Unfortunately, FAC 1 and 2 were not on either of these lists, indicating that they couldn't be reset while in flight. However, another ambiguous statement in the handbook 
allowed pilots to pull other computer circuit breakers as long as they are aware of the consequences. The captain's experience of resetting the fax circuit breakers on the ground may have given him the confidence in his ability to do so in flight. However, the consequences of such action in flight were not documented by Airbus. Only Airbus could provide guidance on the potential outcomes of this action. The clock is ticking and it's been 54 seconds since the fourth master caution alarm went off due to the repeated failures of the rudder travel limiter units. The captain has taken matters into his own hands and reset the FAC-1 circuit breakers located on the overhead panel, causing a fifth master caution alarm to sound due to an electrical interruption. The captain then reset the FAC-2 circuit breakers located behind the right pilot seat, causing the sixth master caution to trigger due to FAC-1 and FAC-2 fault. The consequences of this decision were severe, as it affects various flight parameters controlled by fax, including the wind shear deduction warning and the function of the rudder travel limiter unit. Additionally, the flight control law of the Airbus changed from normal law to alternate law. The situation of AirAsia quickly turned from bad to worse when both the autopilot and autothrust disengaged as they did not receive enough information from the facts to safely fly the plane. Under normal law, the airplane's computers provide assistance to the pilots, limiting their inputs to prevent dangerous situations like stalling, rolling too far or exceeding certain speed limits. However, in alternate law, the pilot has more direct control over the airplane's movements, but must rely on their own skills to maneuver the plane. Now the pilots are forced to fly the plane manually, adding an additional layer of difficulty to an already dire situation. As the aircraft was without its flight augmentation computer, it became more vulnerable to external factors such as wind and turbulence, which could cause the rudder to swing freely and the aircraft to bank. Suddenly, the plane started to roll to the left and reached a 54-degree angle of bank. There was no pilot input or corrective action for 9 seconds. The reason for this delay is likely due to the pilot's attention being directed towards the fault message displayed in the plane's ECAM and trying to figure out what went wrong. When the first officer's attention returned to the primary flight display, he was startled to see the unusual attitude of the aircraft banking to the left. This was a critical situation and the pilots had to act quickly to regain control of the aircraft. As the first officer attempted to correct the roll by moving the side stick to the right, the bank angle reduced from 54 degrees to 9 degrees left. But this rapid correction could have made the first officer feel like they were rolling too much to the right. As the correction was made, the first officer kept pulling back on the side stick, causing the airplane to climb rapidly. However, at this point, the first officer may have become spatially disorientated and overcorrected by shifting the side stick to the left, causing the aircraft to roll back to the left up to 50 degree angle of bank. As the AirAsia flight was rolling to the left and climbing rapidly, the captain realized the gravity of the situation and urgently commanded the first officer, Pull down! Pull down! However, 
the first officer misunderstood the command and continued to input more backward action on the right side stick, causing the plane to rocket up even further. This confusion is due to the contradictory nature of the captain's command. As pull suggests up, while down means down, both cannot be done at the same time. What the captain actually meant was to lower the airplane's nose to reduce the rate of climb, which could have been achieved by pushing the side stick forward. As the airplane climbs rapidly, its speed begins to decrease drastically, approaching stall speed. In aviation, speed is crucial. If the pilots allow the speed to drop further, they will enter a dangerous situation called an aerodynamic stall. This occurs when the airflow over the airplane's wings becomes disrupted, causing a loss of lift and a dangerous descent like a stone falling from the sky. Unfortunately, the first officer keeps pulling the side stick, causing the airplane to climb and lose even more speed. Within seconds, the stall warning in the cockpit begins blaring, alerting the pilots they are entering an aerodynamic stall. The airplane situation worsened as the first officer continued to pull back on the side stick, causing the captain to take control and start pushing forward to save the plane. However, the standard protocol for taking over control was not followed. The captain should have announced, I have control, and the first officer should have responded with phrase, you have control. But in this case, the captain did not formally announce that he was taking over, leading to confusion and the first officer continuing to pull back on the side stick while the captain was pushing forward. This led to further disorientation and lack of progress in correcting the flight path. Airbus planes are not designed to be controlled by two pilots at the same time. Each pilot has their own side stick, and when both side sticks are moved simultaneously, the signals are combined algebraically. If captain moves the side stick forward and the first officer moves backward equally, the signals cancel each other out, and the airplane doesn't move up or down. It is like both pilots have equal say in what the airplane does. Nevertheless, there is a mechanism on the side stick that allows either pilot to take full control of the aircraft. The captain could have gained priority for his control input or assumed full control by completely disabling the first officer's side stick by pressing and holding the takeover push button for 40 seconds. But for some reason, he did not. Normally, if two pilots are moving the controls simultaneously, an oral warning kicks in to voice an alert message, dual input, dual input. But not today. Because the more urgent ongoing stall warning message was suppressing this alert. As the aircraft continued to climb, it reaches a staggering 38,500 feet. But there was a major problem. The speed was as low as 55 knots or just over 100 km per hour. Within seconds, the plane started rolling to the left, plummeting towards the Java Sea. It was a terrifying sight made worse by the continuous blaring of the stall warning in the cockpit. Despite the urgency of the situation, both the pilots continued on with their conflicting inputs, worsening the crisis. Finally, the worst happened. The plane vanished from the Jakarta radar, plunging into the Java Sea, killing all 162 people on board. It was a heartbreaking tragedy that happened in just four minutes from resetting the fax circuit breakers to the moment of collision. The National Transportation Safety Committee of Indonesia took charge of the investigation to uncover the mystery behind the crash. 
the maintenance record of the ill-fated flight 8501 were scrutinized and they revealed a staggering 23 reports of rudder travel limiter issues in the year leading up to the crash. The investigation later uncovered that a cracked desolder joint was to blame for the repeated failures of the rudder travel limiter. Despite multiple failures of the rudder travel limiters, the Airbus A320 aircraft was still capable of a safe flight due to the autopilot and other systems controlled by the fax. However, after the fourth failure, the pilots made the decision to reset the fax circuit breakers, causing the autopilot and autothrottle to disengage and the flight control logic to switch from normal law to alternate law. While the aircraft was still flyable, the subsequent actions of the flight crew led to the prolonged stall from which they were unable to recover. It all began when the captain made a confusing command, telling the first officer to pull down. The committee recommended that AirAsia remind its pilots to use standard callouts during all phases of the flight, including when passing control, with terms like I have control. It was surprising to learn that there was no standard callout procedure for all flight stages, and the committee urged Airbus the plane manufacturer to evaluate its procedures. The Airbus A320 was hailed as one of the safest and most automated planes in the world with advanced safety systems that made it nearly impossible for pilots to lose control of the aircraft. As a result, pilots on Airbus planes were not required to undergo an upset recovery training which teaches pilots how to regain control of an aircraft in the event of an unexpected situation. However, after a thorough investigation, the committee recommended that upset recovery training becomes mandatory for all Airbus pilots. In addition, AirAsia, the operator of the aircraft, was given several recommendations and corrective actions related to pilot training and aircraft maintenance procedures. While the tragedy of AirAsia 8501 will never be forgotten, the lessons learned from this accident have made the aviation industry stronger and more prepared to keep passengers safe.